You're listening to Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong, all on Georgia Radio Network. Welcome to episode 46 of the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. With me is the internet troll, Matt Lowe. What up? <laughs> and the perfect sound effect in the background to, right? to being a troll. Yeah, my little girl decided she didn't like bedtime. And the woman who has been dropping stories like crazy, making my blood boil, <laughs> Jessica Salaji. Hello. How you guys doing? Good, how are you? Man, I tell you what, I'm doing pretty good. Jessica, very good job on Pounding the Strike Zone or whatever your new podcast name is. Thanks. I don't even know what it is, but thanks. No, it, it, it was very good. I mean, obviously you can't really leave us in the dust because you were way better than us to begin with. <laughs> I don't think so. You're the only one with the Price is Right voice. <laughs> I'm Drew Carey now. He kind of looked like him. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> or Bob Barker. But... <laughs> Last I... week, Matt got himself a ban for going after, let's just say, a mentally limited individual. And the slander lawsuits start <laughs> rolling in before we go any further these opinions are ours and not necessarily those of all on georgia <laughs> dave however back, back any to the show <laughs> any medical uh, official would agree with you. <laughs> oh gosh it's like they they caught him parking in the handicap zone about to write him a a ticket, talk to him, go, I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> so getting into national politics, we finally have a woman of color running for president of the United States. Elizabeth Warren has announced her exploratory committee for 2020. Honestly, I knew it was coming, but when I saw the news come out on New Year's, was it New Year's Eve or New Year's Day? I don't remember, but I was like, is this, are we really, are we really doing this? Like when we were all talking about the next election starts now, like I thought we were joking. No. Nope. Oh, I wish it was satire. I really do. You know, or hyperbole, you know, oh, it's start, it's going to start uh, the 1st of 2019. Nope. Well, I'm just disappointed because I want both sides to pick people at this point who, even if they have polarizing views, aren't polarizing people. Elizabeth Warren is a polarizing person because of the positions she's taken and how she's chosen to go about them. And I'm just not in the mood for it. Like, I just, I'm over it. I'm so over the people being the problem. I can respect someone with a different point of view. Right. Obviously. Mm-hmm. I don't know, man. My, the, the funniest thing about that whole thing was was Trump's tweet of her one twenty twentieth. There, man, that was. For I guess for people that don't know, she's a lady that claimed um, Native American heritage. No, she claimed was it Native American or black? No, Native, Native American. American. Native American, and she was like. You know, a thousand and twenty fourth, you know, one one twenty fourths or something like that. So he tweeted a old thing of her campaign of one twenty twentieth. And it, I don't know. I, it struck me as really funny because that's something I would do. But at the same time, I was like, you got to be shitting me that the, you know, the sitting president just did that. So it was a, it was a really weird place for me when I saw that. Well, you know, that's the that's the political crazy like a fox part of Trump is he he's a master of social media. I mean, I wish he would shut his mouth sometimes and 
you know, not go after Mattis after after he left and things like that. But as far as like the meme wars, he may not know know how to uh, to win a war anywhere else, but he can win a meme war. <laughs> But she announces on this Ocasio style Twitter or Facebook live video, and, and Jessica, I assume you've seen it, where she starts acting like a working class Joe. So when she said, "I'm going to get me a beer," I was like, "Is this well-educated woman who has prided herself on working her way?" up the ladder of society and politics really trying to dumb herself down to be cool. I was embarrassed for her. The really embarrassing part was, you know, the husband coming through. She's like, do you want a beer? He's like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> like, don't, don't pull. And as she like patted his. Yeah, don't yeah. pull me into your BS. <laughs> like. The whole thing was totally uncomfortable. And I'm scared that we're going to have more of these because how is she going to come off as relatable as Trump? I mean, he never did anything like this, but with Twitter, he's so, he seems like accessible and, you know, close. So what what is she going to try to do to match that? This has been the elitist Democrat problem for a while, which is I'm going to make myself the, the common working man. It, it's... Like Hillary, it's it's like Hillary was looking at a instruction manual on how to speak to humans with the extend hand, smile, tilt head slightly, and greet, say hello, or how are you doing? Like she didn't understand how to actually interact with people. And being a megalomaniac, I mean, Trump's just natural at it. He's... he's he has fed on it for a long time. I mean, he's, you know, he's a rock star. Uh, it just, it, I was watching an old Miami Vice the other night, and they were going past Trump Tower in New York. I mean, it's just, that's what he is, is the, is the populist person. Now, I'm not saying I like everything that he does or anything else, but it's hard to mess with his populist movement. But even but the fact that she didn't even bring like talk to her husband before she went live, and she's like, "Hey, do you want a beer?" He's like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I only drink red wine, Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I I I really think that there, there's there's another person out there that we don't know about. And obviously at this point in 2007, we didn't know about, about Barack Obama. He was, he was a blip way out there. We were all focused. Um, hold on a second. He was on Oprah in early 2007. I knew who he was. He was on, he was on who? You watch, you watch Oprah. Oprah. Yeah. What is that? Uh, she's gone now. She, She, that was before she got to be like cuckoo. That was when she was, like, legit just had people on to talk. That was when TV was different as a whole. If you Actually, that's back, back, I hope you say, way back to 2007. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, infant. Well, that was no, over I mean, a decade. And, 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 yeah, a decade of TV has changed tremendously. Like, the way that we do talk shows and, I mean, that was, like, reality TV was barely even a thing. Oh, yeah, well, it, the real you world. know. Jimmy Kimmel was on the man show at that point, making fun of Oprah and ending every show with girls jumping on trampolines. And now he's a leader in the pound me too movement. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, that's back when Jimmy Kimmel was actually funny, but yeah, that's, you know, he actually came onto the scene as the anti Oprah trying to be the man's version of Oprah and all that stuff. But, but no, yeah, there's funny. There was some, obscure senator from from Illinois but there'll be somebody like that that pops up you know man I cannot I, I have a hard time believing they're going to run uh, Liz Warren Joe Biden which you know speaking of the Me Too thing uh, I mean you could just fill 
you know, an hour with nothing but pictures of Joe groping women inappropriately at, at press conferences. Uh, but I would take him over Elizabeth Warren because that would be four years of fantastic. <laughs> oh, no, it, it would be not just the memes. They would give us something to talk about. It, 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 really, it really would. It would just be amazing of, of him just, just saying stuff. And you wouldn't even have to like to do it a, a Joe impersonation. You don't have to embellish. He says it on its own. Right. There's no exaggeration to what he says. He's talking about to own a Dunkin' Donuts. You have to have a slight Indian accent. Like all of like everybody like cocked their head to forty five degrees and let their mouth agape. Like yes, some just say that. But they give him such a pass because he's really not that political and he's been through a crap ton in his life in terms of like tragedy and pain. And so people just blow it off. I mean, he's creepy, but like what's ever happened to him? Nothing. It's uncle Joe. Nothing. Yeah. Well, look, if, if you were to they flip the, flip the script on that and put, put an R after his name instead of a D they, you know, they'd be running him out. Or you know what? Even not, even not that. Cause they went and got Al Frank and it's just, He's he's old enough to where you forgive a lot of things, like you know an old man that says, <clears throat> you know, if I was half my age, I'd give those gentlemen callers a run for their money. Which of course mm-hmm. means if you'd let me, I'd have sex with you. Mm-hmm. Well, because old men are are still dirty old men. <laughs> Dirtier with age. I'm just sad about. 2020 being here almost and that the election is starting like i can't think of anything more soul crushing <laughs> it'd be nice to have a break i mean it really would it'd be nice to have a break to you know focus on anything but the next election a break what from, from december de- from from december 4th on till now there's your 30 days. That was your break. Yeah, you had four years, 48 months, you get one of those off. Well, speaking of government, if government did not grant you the ability to pick up roadkill, who would? New Oregon law allows you to pick up, with a permit, roadkill and go home and eat it. I love when government tells us we're more free because they passed a new law. Freedom comes from deregulation and fewer laws. Not this nonsense. Right. This, things like this are, they're a little odd. And the reason that they have to do that, it goes back to, like, we've talked a little bit about our model of conservation and how it works here. And, and it has to do with the fact that animals are held in in a tr- in a, you know they're the people's animals and they're held in trust in the state. So that's why it does this. It's I agree it's stupid, but I kind of like I understand the legal gymnastics as to why we are seeing things like this. Um, I don't think that. I mean, I've I've gone after roadkill stuff before. Um, usually, very little of it is usable, um, but it makes sense in in the western states like that because you know an elk or a moose or something is going to have way more usable meat than than a, a ninety pound whitetail that got you know smacked by a Dodge Ram. So. Well, you know, the Sierra manu- uh, Manual says, uh, with roadkill, if you pull in the leg and just the leg comes with it, not edible. If you pull in the leg and the whole animal comes with, edible. <laughs> it's- One of my favorite parts of the article, like the articles about all this, though, is the how the lawmakers were emphasizing that the permits are free. <laughs> Like, it's still a permit. 
Like, you still have to do something extra for government because of roadkill. Well, it is the ethical thing to do. If you, if you kill an elk on the side of the road or whatever, rather than leaving it to sit there and bloat and wait for, I, I guess in this case, the Oregon Highway uh, uh, cleanup crew to come and take it and throw it into a landfill, you, you take it and make something of it. It's also the ethical thing to do for people who are trying to feed their families, like the Lowe's, who's, I th- believe, one of his sons, after they hit a squirrel, says, can we go back and get that dad? <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm curious about that part of it, though. Is it, is it something that you're... Is, is it issued before the fact? Like, do you Af- have to- After. No, you have... Yeah, you have, like... Seven Something times? like that, yeah. You have after the fact. You have to take the the head and uh, oh, here it is. Twenty four hours after sell after salvaging it. Jesus Christ, how would they know? Well, that's the thing. If I, if I make it home with it, oh, you know what that is. They I, want to make sure you're on. not trophy hunting with your truck. No, they're doing that. <laughs> they're doing that because they're wanting to keep an accurate count on on their elk herds. Because all right, so we're a little different here in Georgia. Like, our the the the, the ungulates that plague us are white-tailed deer, and there's like a million of them. Um, and I, I don't mean that as an exaggeration. The 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 white-tail numbers hover somewhere around one million. When we drop to about nine hundred thousand deer in the state, the hunters start complaining that they're not seeing them. When we get to one point one, one point two million, you know, the the insurance com- the car insurance companies are lobbying for longer seasons and, and, and bigger or more tags. Um so they they've kinda hovered somewhere around the one million mark seems to keep everybody happy. But elk are different, right? Uh, you know, Colorado has the largest elk herd in the in the nation, and it's somewhere between two hundred fifty and three hundred thousand animals. So, yeah, but here's the thing: there are other predators. There's other ways these animals can die. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There I is. mean, look, if it was just as simple as going online, for instance, there's and and we're pissed about this too, but there's a snapper check system that you report that before you unload your boat, you go on, take your phone out and you, you check in how many snapper that, that you brought in. And that's just for accounting thing, uh, to try to keep an eye on the, uh, uh, on the number of snapper that are coming in. Not that I have any idea how many are actually in the Gulf of Mexico, but sending in the head almost seems like they're want to make sure that the, uh, uh, the guy that hits it with the pickup truck isn't going to mount it on his wall. Like you can have the meat, but you can't have a trophy. I didn't see anything where it said they had to 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 send in the head. But that would I don't know that'd be a little weird anyway. But I just like I just assumed that that applying for the permit for the salvage was just to help them keep up with numbers. It- it says regulations for the permits require drivers to submit animal heads and antlers to the department within five business days. How about that? To the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Huh. Now, that would be one of the funnier things to do in my house, would be to put a animal head on the wall, and instead of a gun hanging under it, hang, you know, you know the bumper. My wife won't let me hang animal heads here. I have a I have a uh, a dolphin a my my on the wall. I did tell her last year when I went to Colorado elk hunting that if I killed an elk, I was hanging that thing above our bed. Are your ceilings tall enough? If I mount it low enough. <laughs> now that's that that starts to get really really <laughs> creepy. For intimacy. <laughs> like, let me move around the elk head and get to you, baby. Nah, use them like handlebars. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> I 
I don't have any animals hanging on my walls. I did have some glitter antlers for my rustic Christmas tree. Though. Yeah. There used to be that deer head, well, it was some kind of a piece of art work that was behind where you recorded. Yeah. It's still in my office, but that's from Hobby Lobby. That's not like from nature. Uh-huh. No, I no, I do have a couple of Euro mounts that are downstairs, just because the downstairs is done very rusticy with, you know, metal and wood and whatnot. So there's uh, a Euro mount is for those that don't know is the one where you see just the skull, and you know it's it's gone through a process of beetles and bleaching and things like that to make the skull real white, and then. They, usually put some kind of a lacquer on the antlers to keep their color intact. Well, on that note, (laughs) (laughs) Illinois is graciously allowing nursing mothers to skip jury duty. (sighs) This just ticks me off. Why? Because we're creating laws for special groups of people. You can already submit to a judge and request to be excused from jury duty, and it's up to the judge to decide. But no, we need a law. We need a law. And before any haters know, I've never nursed a child, but let me tell you something. Like, if you go to a, I mean, like, life happens. Life, you get called for jury duty. Get over it. Like... We don't need Get out of it like everybody else. Yeah. You know, my, my thought on it is if you're still out of work, you know, postpartum, you're going to be exempted. The same way you would be if you had any other, if you were disabled any other way. You know, the first whatever 12 weeks or whatever. I don't think you need a state law to get involved because you're not going to stay a judge very long if you're telling a mother you know two weeks out of out of a a c-section that hey bottle that stuff up and get in here we have a trial to do (laughs) well and my thing is is was it happening really that much that someone was like oh my gosh we've got to take action or did it happen to one or two women who were just mouthy? You know, that's it? a that's a really good question. Kind of what I was thinking is, did it even happen, or is it already right. part of this part of this uh, nursing movement? And look, I nursing is is very important for those that can. It's a it's a bond of the baby. It's it's you know Matt probably knows more about it than either one of us, uh, just because you know, he's you know he's married to to a doula. But it's it's all it's all very important, and I certainly don't think that women should be shamed for it and and thrown into dirty bathrooms and all that stuff. And I I just don't think it needs a law, a specific law making a separate class of citizen to have the common sense of, hey, the baby needs me for food. You can't take me away from the baby to go to a trial when the baby needs me for food. Right. And, he, and this could have probably been covered under a, a myriad of other legitimate excuses for not doing jury duty. Right. Or have your, you know, your court association for the state enact a policy so that it's not an unequitable law, but you just have a standing policy in your court system that allows judges to use their discretion on something like this. I mean, we do that all the time. We just, without having a law, we they took away our transparency and limited cameras and stuff in the superior courts. They did that by policy through the court association. So, you know, why bother going through the legal Stop process? being reasonable, you heretic. Yeah, I know. So go on, talk about the next stupid thing Illinois did. <laughs> there are so many. So, Illinois decided that we needed another law. <laughs> so, hunters have to wear bright orange. And so many square inches of bright orange, depending on the state. Usually but now, 500 square inches. Which is not a problem on somebody my size. Uh, now, 
you have a choice. You can either wear bright orange or bright pink. Matt, please tell me there's some logical reason right, this came so out. It, here's the thing that's stupid about it is... <laughs> no, I asked if there... I tell me the logical reason that they did this. Because for whatever reason, the camo makers... The fastest growing segment within the hunting community are female hunters. And they, the camo makers are catering to that with a plethora of pink trimmed camo. Um, and so I guess in order to have everything all matchy matchy, uh, blaze pink is, is an option. So Illinois is not the first one to do this. Colorado had just done it when I went out. Um, and I think the thing that I find strange about it is, all right, so Illinois also, you can't hunt with a rifle there because the population is so dense. Um, they don't, it's not like, the, you know, the wide open spaces that we have here. So you can hunt with a shotgun, uh, which kind of more or less limits you to about 100 yards. Um, so I don't really, like, I don't understand the blaze orange to begin with in Illinois, but whatever. I think my favorite um, blaze orange policy is from the state of Idaho, who their um, Fish and Game Commission like just issued a statement that says, you know, we're charged by law to preserve, protect, perpetuate, and manage wildlife in the state of Idaho. There's certain things that you should and shouldn't do. Um, it's our opinion that uh, wearing hunter orange enhances hunting safety in many circumstances, and we strongly encourage you to wear hunter orange as a voluntary safety measure when appropriate for that hunt. Which I just, I like, I really, I like that because they're saying, yeah, it's a good idea. Well, no, absolutely. That's the thing is, <clears throat> it's on you. There was a cartoon years and years and years ago uh, that was, was talking about hunting. It was a how-to hunt. And it was a Saturday morning, you know, cartoon. So it was, obviously meant to be funny. I remember that It was one. talking about wearing, what to wear in the field. And then it says, and of course the mother-in-law outfit. And she puts it on and it has, if she slips, uh, puts the hoodie up and it's got antlers on it and all that stuff. So yeah, it is, you know, it's absolutely on, on you to, to protect yourself. And whether it's blaze orange, blaze pink, uh, it, you know what? Here's the thing about it all, and I'm going to interrupt you. What and what I'll explain why it is that I even know about Idaho, and that's because we're planning a hunt there this fall. Uh, the other is is pink, orange, yellow, all of these bright colors. They all occur naturally in the woods. If if they really wanted to make you wear a color that does not occur naturally outside of a marine environment is they would put us in some kind of an electric blue, like a Pepsi blue vest. Because there is not, you know, like during leaf season, man, you get all kinds of shades of bright orange, pinks and reds, but there's nothing blue. Well, I was thinking the same thing about going out west with having the desert behind you and the uh, sunrise and sunset is if you're wearing blaze orange out west, man, it, uh, especially with the low humidity and, and all that stuff, you're just going to disappear in, into the sun. And you're right, a, a, a blue would stick out. But here's the thing. Wear whatever you want. Wear a tiara with, uh, with sparklers on top if, if you think that makes you safer. <laughs> sparklers on top. <laughs> I do paint the picture, yes. don't I? <laughs> oh 
gosh. I mean, I'm surprised. Honestly, Matt, I was like kind of holding back my snarky comments about the vests and the colors because I think it's a ridiculous law. Like hunter safety is like gun safety. It's a personal decision. It's best practices, you know? Right. But responsible people do the responsible thing. In But depending on the circumstances, I mean, you're going to know when you, I don't know. Anyway. No, I agree. Here's the thing is hunting around here where I like I legitimately run into other people all the time. I'm I'm wearing orange because while I trust myself, I don't I don't I I run into a lot of dumbasses. But out there, man, there was you know those states have we like we have a million acres of of public land here. Plus, you know, I mean, and only like 1% of the state is public land. Out there, you have, you know, Colorado had 25 million acres. We didn't see another person until, I think, mean, like day six. You also didn't see any game. <laughs> <laughs> we saw game on day, well... We saw the elk on day five. We saw we saw deer every day. Well, yeah, I've been out to Colorado too, and I've seen them from the golf course, but they're you know three thousand yards away. You just see right. them. There's no, no. Now, when we first saw those elk, they were one point three miles away, and it was the next morning when when we were um, we put those elk to bed, and the next morning while we were stalking in is when we ran into other people. You needed the artillery at 1.3 miles away. It was funny, man. There was like literally a town between us and the elk. (laughs) Now, speaking of other stupid states, New York is enacting a drug take back act requiring Drug manufacturers to take back unused drugs. What? And it's... The the idea being that you should not keep opiates around your house. And they want you to not flush them or put them in the water system. Right. So they, you know, like, especially like down here, we have... At pharmacies and the police station and stuff, you can go take your prescription pills and dump them off, and they will dispose of them however they feel is proper. You can also bring them to me. (laughs) But this is insane. First of all, okay, I'm sure there is a cost associated with destruction because I don't know how they destruct them without getting them into the water supply. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know the process. But I wonder if they burn them. But collection, them. there's no cost. You put a bin at the police station and you put a bin at the pharmacies and people put them in there. Like the cost is so minimal. So one saying, oh we're gonna hold these drug companies accountable is nonsense. And two, we're already, there's already groups doing that. There's nonprofits all over the country that do non that do like un not related to taxpayers. They do programs that are effectively getting old drugs off the streets. Man, what do you what do you want to bet? The government's going to do it, and they're going to send a bill to the drug manufacturers um, with a cut. Yeah, naturally. You know, I got. Uh, cough syrup with uh, codeine in it uh, after you know my, my little stuff last month and I was at Walmart getting it filled because I'm an idiot and went to Walmart to get my prescription filled at Christmas time and the pharmacist pulls me over and hands me his little bag and says well if you don't use all of it and I'm like oh you put this in keep it shelf stable for longer she goes no that disables all the codeine that's in it so you can throw it away I'm like you could we don't throw narcotics away at my house. So, I mean, I am of the same type of belief. I mean, I have kidney stones. And 
I get them multiple times a year. Like, I'm not going to be like, oh, well, these are passed. I'm just going to dump these. There's no way in hell. And. Well, yeah, I mean, look, there's there's there are no kids in my house. There are narcotics, bourbon and guns and so everybody's like perfectly safe. Yeah, I mean, again, yeah. responsible people taking care of their belongings. I mean, the getting to the point where we have maybe that it's illegal to have prescriptions that are more than like two years old or something. I could totally see someone like Renee Unterman or Sharon Cooper or somebody under the gold dome proposing a law like that because they don't want these things. Yeah. Listen, they were born with all these stupid ideas. I am so happy to have Renee Underman. I was worried when both my District 19 rep and the outgoing Lieutenant Governor were gone, that we would have no one just to use (laughs) as a punching bag. And Renee opens her mouth, and I'm like, oh, thank God. And she's only getting started. Like. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and for the listeners, we are coming. We didn't just come. Yeah, you know, we did not come out of the holiday season. We're going into it from a political uh, uh, commentary standpoint. We're coming into the season mm-hmm. when these idiotic bills are coming out of our state house, and people on other podcasts around the country are talking about the stupid stuff coming out of Georgia. That's coming and up. And Renee does not like when people talk poorly about her or her legislation. She tried to get me fired in 2015. I would love to get the phone call from her uh, trying to get me fired. By the way, it's Dr. Cool, heating and air, 678-952-2323. Go ahead and give me a call, Renee, and get me fired. Who's the owner of Dr. Cool? Connie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's not happy with us ladies we're recording this right now. I was going to say, you know, it could backfire. Well, what was she going to do? Claim I'm having an affair with her? I've seen her. Oh, Renee. You don't have enough bourbon. Yeah. When she's not, you know, ruining people's lives, she's shooting at people. Or lying. Mm -hmm. Lying about a record. But it's nice to see that she's on board with the medical marijuana now after years and years of, you know, blocking it. Anyway, let's not. I'm sure that the time will come during the legislative session where we dedicate an entire show to her. So let's save some of that material. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I'm so happy to have her. I wouldn't go that far. Uh, for I'd a, rather. Same reason that you want Joe Biden. Not because of good policy. Yeah. I long for the day where we don't need for... a podcast to make fun of politicians. That would be my dream, that I could just go be a yoga instructor somewhere and not have to worry about these jackasses. Yoga instructor. Mm-hmm. But here I am. You know, the, the thing is, you get done doing hot yoga and get done dealing with politicians, you're just as dirty. <laughs> Have you ever been to hot yoga, Dave? What the hell do you think? I'm just asking. I already know that Matt has not. I can't see my toes. <laughs> Doesn't mean you can't reach for I, them. I say that. <laughs> I say that. You know, I lost. I lost a bunch of weight being sick. It's. It's a. At one point, I lost ten pounds in nine days. That is rapid. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, it's not exactly the right way to do it. I don't suggest pneumonia for weight loss, but it works. Jenny Craig ain't, ain't got shit on that. So, <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of fat in there we can trim. The meat in our, in our podcast today is going to focus on paternal rights in Georgia. And no one is more qualified to speak about it than Jessica and I, <laughs> being the two childless people. <laughs> Listen, you all you have to know is freedom and equity under the law. That's all you have to understand. Any issue. 
You don't have to smoke weed so, to advocate for it. You don't have to have kids to be, you know, against them. Right. Yeah, you don't have to be. You don't have to be a police officer to comment on the behavior of police officers. Just like you don't have to have served in the military to be the commander in chief. Uh, it's funny thing is uh, I was sit. My lawyer called a buddy of mine. We were sitting in his office today. I said. <laughs> Would you ask Dean if he handles divorce? <laughs> and he asked his kid, Dave wanna know if he handled divorce. Like, Does Dave get a divorce? He's, oh, I don't think so. I think Dave likes living inside. <laughs> but, you know, there's some things that I, you know, in researching the subject that I found interesting. Uh, one of which being inherently, if conceived out of wedlock, the father has no rights. There has to be a court motion to legitimize the child. Correct. Which is not connected to child support. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, you can get nailed for child support. And I say you. I, I think you and I are pretty safe for, for, not, for not having that. But you can pay child support Correct. and have no rights. Did we... They can say you, you are responsible, but you don't have a right to visitation or opinion or anything else. Sorry, Jessica, I cut you off. No, I was just going to say, did we kind of preface that our angle here is that we're talking about, like, almost, I guess what some might call, like, a disparity of paternal rights or a lack thereof in Georgia specifically? Like, we kind of just... Yeah, we did just kind of jump right into it, didn't we? I just want to make sure... No, it's fine. I just want to make sure everyone knows, like, that's our... That's where all three of us are coming from because... We've either researched it or had a personal experience with it or been the child of divorce or something where we've been, we've seen, like, how the law is not applied equally. And so that's kind of where this discussion is headed. Right. Just wanted to... And I thought, in, in reading the stories, something, I saw something very, very interesting, which is the assumption that a father can't be a caregiver. That changed. No, what I'm saying, uh, uh, it used to be that it was assumed that, and when I say used to be, I'm talking about like 20s, 30s, 40s, right? It was assumed that children would go with the father in the event of a divorce because they could financially care for the children, right? And then somewhere in like the 60, late 60s, getting into the early 70s or whatever, that whole thing just kind of flipped and became, it, it was assumed that children would go to the mother. That's interesting that you say that because what I was reading, and of course, like, you know, it depends on who wrote it and when and all of that, but I was reading that it's like, the tender years doctrine, which said which that... Which is alive and she, well in the state of Georgia, by the way. Well, but they it goes back to the 20s where they said that children are psychologically dependent on the mother. And then in the 70s is when it was, quote, the best interest doctrine, which I think a lot of judges try to say, oh, we adhere to that. But, I mean, you can sit there and listen and watch them, watch their faces and their body language as the dad testifies and realize they're not really, you know... They've already made up their mind based on the tender years doctrine. Right. I mean, it's it's rare that you see a toddler placed with the father unless the mother just does something atrocious. I, I, and here's here's the the personal experience side of it. When so we we talk about the fact that I have seven kids. Um, what we don't talk about a whole lot is that two of them biologically are mine from a from a previous marriage. Three are my wife's biological from a previous marriage, and then two are ours. Um, both of our exes are out of the picture altogether. Um, mine died several years ago. But when I was going through the divorce with my first wife, I... I went after custody of my children. Um, my youngest son was 13 days old when we separated. 
um, he was a year and eight months, I think, when everything became final. Um, and like I, I, I proved during the course of the of the the custody battle that she was like while she was pregnant, um, drinking, smoking, using illegal drugs, that she was still using illegal drugs uh, after the fact. And the judge looked at me and he said, I cannot in good conscience take a child away from its mother during its tender years. It's unbelievable. Come back when he's two. That's what he told me. Now, everyone that knows me personally knows that at 23 months of age, I got custody of my kids because she was high and flipped a vehicle um, where she was ejected. Um, My children were in the vehicle. They were fine. They were buckled in. Um, And she never... She sustained some some pretty substantial head injuries from that, and never never regained the ability to care for the kids after that. So, but yeah, didn't even make it to two years old. That's insane, though. How can I? I mean, I understand like the the repercussions of taking a child away from its mother, but my God illegal drug use that you can prove that is sometimes admitted that sometimes is admitted by law enforcement and caseworkers from defects and everything and they still say well you know moms are moms like it's i don't know man it's 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 very strange because i you know we all sit around and we look at at, at stories of you know kids who who got killed by a parent, right? And we're like, God, I can't believe how did it get to there? Well, this, that, this kind of nonsense. That's how it got there. But it's because, I don't know, man, the, the laws are so, and it's not even a law. It's really just, it's a perspective in general regarding all of it. And, and frankly, like men are totally shit on by the legal system. Like, from the word go. Well, But where is that coming from? Because it's not like in criminal cases where you have a prosecutor advocating for, you know, a certain outcome or something. Like, you're talking about a party on party here, civil domestic matters, and, you know, men end up having to have female attorneys and seek out women to to appear a different way and to have a different angle. And it's just, where is this mentality of judges coming from? Well, that that it's perpetuating like this. I don't know that it's necessarily the, like I, part of me thinks that it's just kind of our culture in general. Like there is, there is, man, and I hate to even say this because I'm going to sound like one of those people, but but like there's, there's a bit of a culture of man hating in general, right? I, I remember when I was a child, um, and, and the very first episodes of Roseanne came out, and I remember saying to my mom, "Man, I'm like, they wouldn't have a TV show on like that if the if the husband was talking to the wife that way." And then, so like, think about think about the various TV shows that that you watch where where husbands are portrayed as just a doofus um, and then think about the kind of things that you that you hear married women say you know um, you know some some lady who's married and has three kids and, and, and jokes around with her girlfriends that she has four kids because of the husband mm-hmm. you know so you know, you've got that or you know now you hear man child quite a bit um well, there's also been a recent trend to condemn the phrasing that the dad is babysitting. Like, no, you're just caring for your children. It's not when the mom's away that dad's babysitting. They're his children, too. Like, there's been a... I've seen a lot of 
stuff on social media and even in like the legal realm of the right terminology and I mean I know we're all in this day and time but it's all about what's politically correct and not offensive but if you think about the idea I can understand the idea if you're not just taking it from a perspective of everything offends me right if you think about the concept that you know a dad yeah he may work but it's just as much his child why is he a babysitter but the mother is a caretaker right and a well, that, and some of that goes back to the hunt, even back to hunter gatherer, is is the <clears throat> what exactly what feminists are fighting against? The the weaker, fairer sex stays back with the children, and the man goes out and slays the beasts. Um, that mentality, it, it, one of the stories that that you know came out with outline was. A guy who worked from home when he was trying to explain this to a 70-something-year-old judge who didn't understand that you can work from home, he he kept saying, so you're unemployed. So you're not a good provider, and you just hang out at home, you're unemployed, and you want custody of these children, you can't possibly provide for them. Right. And, and, you know, I like my sports analogies. If you want to, from the bench, say that Ty goes to the rudder, uh, so if everything is equal, the mother should probably have kids under, under 10. That's fine. But that's, that's not what's happening is they're saying there's such a high standard to prove a mother unfit where you're right. The, the father is, is assumed to be, you know, all the jokes that, you know, mothers are, aware of first loves, teachers' names, their best friends, and fathers are vaguely aware that short people live in the house. Um, Which... And there there is some of that, but you would think the feminists would be the ones beating the drum saying equality, equality, equality. Yeah, they're all about that until it's time to take their kids away. Right. It's a, hey, we can be the earner too. We can be the hunter-gatherer too. You know, why... Why can't, you know, my husband stay home until, until the husband goes, you know what, you owe me this much in child support, this much in alimony, and you must keep me in the lifestyle to which I've been accustomed to being your husband and taking care of our children. And they go, whoa, that's ridiculous. <laughs> right. I don't it's, it, You kind of hit on it, it though, it, man. It, it, as you said, you said you have to prove the mother unfit. And, and that really is the case. And that's a very high standard. And the fact that that you don't, uh, well, for starters, if you're not married, you, you, the man has to prove the kid is his, which means he's footing the bill for DNA testing. And that's five hundred bucks. I know because I've done it. Um, the other is is you know it's assumed that the mother is a better fit. You know, like the, I don't know, this, it's, it's not an equal, it's kind of like what Jessica was saying, it's not an equal thing under the law that, you know, we, we get to prove the man, or prove the, the mother's unfit, but the man is almost assumed. Right, well, it's sort of like what I was saying, tie goes to the runner, uh, which just means that the ball and the runner get to the base at the same time, the runner wins. But that's not what's happening here. What's happening is they're spotting the mother 40 points. And, we're just, and you're starting from a 40-point disadvantage to say, hey, listen, you know, she's a horrible person. You know, and it's the same thing with, with spousal abuse. If you remember that story out of, and I think it was Columbus a couple of years ago, of an army ranger who, after being beaten by his wife, uh, and then she, of course, accused him of, of abuse, set up a hidden camera, and finally got him, you know, when they were, during their separation, swapping kids, and got her, you know, beating the snot out of him, and him not laying a hand on her, because that's not what we do. It's, you know, this this dude was, dude's right. a big guy, and could easily defend himself. And in, 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 in that sort of case, but was not going to raise a hand against a woman. But no one would believe that he was the abusee unless he had 
evidence, unless he had video evidence. You know, so, and of course, it's a, it's a point of embarrassment for a guy uh, to, to go and say, uh, yeah, my, oh, yeah, my dude, wife I beats carried, me. I carried a black eye on three different occasions from my ex-wife, who was 98 pounds and five foot four. And I, you know, oh, I, you gotta I, whatever. You gotta love the crazy ones, ones, man. Don't marry the crazy ones. Twenty pounds, right? But yeah, she blacked my eye more than once, and like I'll talk about it now. But then, man, I was making all kinds of shit <laughs> up about what happened. <laughs> so. and, and, and you know, we make jokes about you know getting hit with a frying pan and stuff like that. That, that shit uh, legitimately hurts, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I usually have to pay extra for that. But but yeah, is is we make jokes about that kind of stuff and and I certainly don't want to take the humor out of it. Uh out of, you know, legitimate things that are funny and not not trying to go, you know, snowflake or ultra liberal on it and say we can't joke about gen- gender roles. No, it's it's perfectly fine to joke about, but it's also comedy has been has been used to highlight things in society and one of those things is men are at a disadvantage when going right. to court against a woman uh, uh, the Duke rape al- uh, allegations every woman deserves to be believed no right. some are liars I think uh, yeah. oh go ahead no I was just going to say I mean you, you brought up Duke and that just Makes me think, I mean, you, you can't rape a man under Georgia law. You can't, when you go to court for charges, no, like, depend, no matter what the magnitude of the crime, a man is more likely to have to prove himself innocent instead of the other way around. Like, I mean, look at, if you're talking about the way that the court system is, look at the teachers who have affairs with their students and the sense that the female teachers get versus a male um, teacher gets. I mean... The whole system is anti-male, if that's... No, I agree. I, you know, in, in my circle of friends, like, I have... And they're constantly, you know, they'll pick up those stories. I've got, like, a, a group text, right, with uh, five or six of my hunting buddies. And they'll be like, they'll send pictures, you know, of the latest female teacher who's typically very attractive. It's like, oh, this this poor, poor child... That, that she abused and like I try I, I wrestle with that because to a degree like I remember when I was 15 you know or and that it, it likely wouldn't have been abuse and it very much would have been a consensual thing on my part however the law says it's not but it's like it's that mentality and even amongst men that that kills it for us you know right well a guy who graduated a year ahead of me married my English teacher like the summer he graduated and I assure you their wedding night was the, not the first time they tried it, tried it out which was weird because when I was a senior he was a chaperone <laughs> along with her uh, it's it's nothing new, especially in colleges. I mean, as you know, I do a lot of work with college co-eds, <laughs> counseling them and making you know, guiding them through life. Now, it's not it's not unusual, and it hasn't been. I think it is rel- relatively new for the these female teachers to go as young as they have been, but every one of us who remembers bumbling around trying to figure things out for ourselves uh, as 15, 16 year olds with, with girls would, would have appreciated a 25 year old to take you by the hand and go, let me show you how this is done. Do this. Don't do that. Right. Yeah. Why are you in such a rush? So yeah, there's because, because we can see ourselves from, from our, uh, from ourselves when we're 15, 16 years old, we also see ourselves as protectors of women. 
So when we find out that a little girl had the same experience, even, even though, um, you know, could have been a very attractive coach, but, you know, we see ourselves as, as protectors, you know, as, Hey, I, I want to protect that girl. I, I don't know if that's a, even a, co- a coherent thought, but that's kind of where we go with it is if I, if, if I made a, a your mama joke to you in middle school, it's like, okay, we're going to fight. If I talk about your daddy, like, what would they say in a scream? So? I don't know him. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, you, you, you defend your mom and then your dad is, right. my dad can beat up your dad. I usually got, I usually got to win those so, because my dad was a cop in, for, the, for Cobb County. Certainly. Not only. Yeah. I said not only can my dad beat up your dad, but he will chase him down, beat him with a stick, and then right. charge him with resisting. <laughs> Sorry, oh, Jessica. No, I was just going to go back to the paternal rights thing and just, you know, it seems like there has been progress made in terms of, like, the conversations that people are willing to have. I think that there are a lot more women who are willing to acknowledge it, which, I mean is literally half the problem but um and of course i think there's men who if they don't have kids like they're just they probably don't know that this is happening but you know what i don't know man i was reading a book um by uh, a lady called uh, her name's helen smith and it's called men on strike and it's kind of like even just to the, <clears throat> the casual observer right like it's pretty apparent that in society once you start getting into marriage and children and things like that that if things go sideways that men get a raw deal like that's sure but i mean dave what was your understanding and knowledge of this subject before we started talking about it you know and 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 i knew that the the tendency was to, you know, give the kids to the mom. Uh, the tendency is is to believe to believe the woman, and as much as you have lifetime movies about, you know, men suck and and all that stuff, is the guys have the same horror stories of of the woman who, you know, bruises herself during a divorce and then goes and says he was an abuser. Uh, the one that goes goes and gets an order of protection uh, against the uh, against the husband because she wants to make sure that she can she can keep custody of the kids and uh, and hit him financially and and stuff like that. So I mean, I, I was aware of it. What I didn't know is so, some of the quirky laws and court cases that that came along with it. Well, I guess what I'm getting at is like, yeah, people are aware of it, but it, it's only been in the last literally five to ten years that states have started doing anything about it i mean there are putting pl- things into place saying that you know until you get divorced or until your divorce is final that everything has to be 50 50 and you have to see your kids 50 percent of the time unless otherwise arranged or other states are saying that you know like i, I don't know there it just seems like there's more of an effort from the legal system, whether that's coming from attorneys in the legislature or what, they're at least trying to start at a neutral playing ground before they, or give the perception of it before they just chop it all up to one side. Right. Well, Florida passed a 50-50 law that Rick Scott uh, vetoed. And of course, as as, again, as a guy, like, you know, it kind of got my, my, you know, Irish up a little bit until I read his quote on it, which I thought was interesting, and is that every case in family court needs to be handled individually. Right. Uh, that, and, 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 I, and I thought his quote was really good on it. Now, I don't know if that's really how what he believes or if he was uh, capitulating to uh, the the Christian right to make sure that he could get his Senate run and, and all that stuff. Cause there's a, there, even amongst Republicans, especially there's a assumption 
in the family values crowd that the children should stay with the mother. So I don't know if that was his motivation or truly, you know, from a legal standpoint of saying that judge should walk in the courtroom without prejudice and say, and, and both, you know, mother and father are on equal playing field and let's see what's happening instead of the government saying it will be 50 50 unless uh, we can prove one or the other is is unfit or undeserving or dangerous or, or, or whatever so else my question is is equal playing ground when you start is that zero and zero for both or 50 50 here's here's the I don't way know. that's a good question Here's how I feel about it. I, I think that it should be 50 50. Um, like, that's how it starts out. Because, look, most people, I, I realize that that I, my ex wife is the exception, right? Like, people say, oh, my ex is crazy. She legitimately was. Um, and so I know that, that my experience here is. It, 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 with her is the exception. My experience with family court is the rule. But I think that it should start out at 50-50. I also think that child support um, should be based the same way. Um, one of the things that I learned during my divorce was that even if we had Full joint custody where the children spent 50% of their time with me and 50% of their time with their mother I still paid the same amount of child support to her that I would if they spent no time with me like it wasn't even factored in to the thing and I was like I don't understand that doesn't make sense and they were like well, somebody has to pay for the kids. And I'm like, yeah, she pays for them when, she, when they're with him, and I'll pay for them when they're with me. And they're like, no, nah, that's not how that works. Well, was there an income disparity, uh, disparity there? Well, yeah. I don't know. I mean, but like, that's... There's, I mean, there's horror stories about that stuff, man. Specific. There was one out of California... It was, interestingly, it was one of those uh, things where, like, the uh, it was a teacher and a student, it was a 15-year-old boy, and she got pregnant, and he was ordered to pay child support to her as a victim, as a victim of abuse. Technically, under the law, and, as, a, as a kid who was just raped. It's, uh, it, it, that book, Men on Strike, that's what I was, where I was... It was talking about it there. There was another one uh, case out of southern Alabama where, like, this dude got completely trashed at a party, passed out, um, and a woman uh, had sex with him and, he, like, bragged to the people there that she had done it. And uh, he got – or she got pregnant as a result of that encounter. And uh, the dude had – multiple witnesses from the parties you know point out that he was out of it um, did not make the decision to engage in intercourse with the woman and he was still ordered to pay child support but are they still cousins I don't know probably in everyone in Alabama and, and, and you know the 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 big thing is usually, this stuff is handled before it ever sees a courtroom. Uh, but the scary thing is, is most attorneys will guide their male clients to go ahead and take a bad deal. You don't, you don't want to go to trial with this. You're going to lose. You're, you know, you're fighting an uphill battle just walking into court. So the attorneys will, will sort of guide their clients. And, and I don't think it's malicious. I think they are really out there to guide the their clients in the way to keep as much right. of their kids as they can. No, yeah, no, no, they definitely guide them based on their experience and what they've seen. And of course, you know, it, it's it's way too general to say 
attorneys and judges. As most family law t- attorneys in a certain area will know the way a judge goes. They'll know if a judge is a man hater. They'll know if a judge is a is one of these people, a uh, seventy eight year old who doesn't understand that a man could be a stay at home dad and still be a, a a decent guy. Well, now that we have solved that for the entire world, what do we have for closing thoughts, Matt? <laughs> I, was, I was waiting on Jessica. It sounded like she was going to say something. Oh, uh, let's see. Closing thoughts. Uh, I am. Um, let's see. This is, I guess this is our. I've got this show and one more. And then I'll be on vacation. And I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> we'll be out of the country for about 10 days so. without kids without yeah. kids oh the eighth and <laughs> low is coming that's what people keep saying <laughs> <laughs> you, you may never see the deck of the boat right <laughs> Jessica have any closing thoughts we talked about a lot of stuff that's been going on this week like everything that's been on my mind we've kind of talked about so right just you know pray for a state level shutdown oh god oh how wonderful would that be oh that's right the legislature uh starts up Mm. while i'm gone they do they do that was gonna be my closing thought is uh clutch your wallet they're coming (laughs) right Oh, here's my closing thought from last week, uh, and Jessica, you, you won't you won't like this one. Is uh, and I know it's I'm minimizing a, a horrible crime, but at 3,600 minors a year with uh, being sold into sex slavery in the state of Georgia alone, that's 10 a day, Brian Kemp. If that's the case, why is the GBI running any other operation besides sending out these Liam Neesons to find who is taking these girls? Do you want me to answer that? Because yes. Vernon Keenan, who just retired as of December 31st, was so incompetent and so unfocused on the issues that are plaguing Georgia that he couldn't direct, as the director of the GBI, anybody else to do anything worthwhile with our tax dollars in law enforcement. Well, and again, it's, it's, it's when politicians inflate numbers... You, you have to wonder why. Exactly. I, Especially about something like this. Ten a year is atrocious. They're children and adult. They're human beings. Like, it's a terrible. You don't have to embellish this. Right. Right. And, and look, the, the thing that gets lumped together with this statistic, too, and yeah, you know, and 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 just getting in, into the weeds is the seventeen-year-old runaway drug addict, and the six-year-old get lumped in together when you say minors. Mm-hmm. Obviously, so uh, selling anybody is, is is wrong, and taking advantage of of drug addicts is wrong. Uh, but those are two different classes of of disgusting people. Absolutely. Uh, so when they lump stuff in together, just like they lumped in medical marijuana with hemp, which are two very different things together in order to, in order to maneuver it politically. When they start lumping things in together and throwing in big numbers, it has everything to do with taxing us. Just like they did, I guess, the, the strip club, the stripper bill to, to tax strippers in order to, to make this go away. And obviously it's not. I'm so glad you said that because, um, you know, we've kept everybody a really long time. And that's a great way for me to remind everybody that the law passed in 2015 to tax strip clubs has been in effect for almost four years and not one time has a strip club been found to be responsible for trafficking humans. Right. Not once. Wow. But they're taxing them anyway. I'm not shocked. No, you're not shocked because it happens at hotels and salons and nail places and massage parlors, not 
strip clubs where they're out in the open and people are already being scrutinized by the law enforcement. Give me a break. Yeah, truck stops. Yeah. Totally. Truck stops. Look, and they tend to mash things together. We will get an influx of hookers and strippers and all that stuff for the for the Super Bowl because that's just what happens. Uh, they must be gearing up for it. I've seen some new some new hookers down by my office. Just this week. What is there like a train? Yeah, or I've, something? but what, I mean, I've I've seen the hookers around your office, and they're not Super Bowl quality. No, man, a couple of them are. That's why I'm saying I think they haven't uh, figured it out yet. <laughs> I mean, most of them are like Canadian Football League level. I mean, they are not NFL and Super Bowl level. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, man, some of these new ones, it's like, dang. <laughs> <laughs> So is, this is not. They're going to figure not, it out and they're going to leave. But this is yeah. This is not the lunch at the uh, at the Gold Club. This is this is a uh, Friday night high end. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So to 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 end a sincere statement on the completely uh, misogynistic musings of Matt Lowe and Dave Roberts. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the first podcast of 2019. For Jessica Salaji, Matt Lowe, I'm no, Dave wait. Roberts. You can't sign off yet. <sighs> no? No, we got to tell people that they got to like drop some comments, send us messages or something like that about topics that they'd like to see more discussion on. Yeah, and if you made it to this in point in the podcast, send us your address. We'll send you $5 because you listen for forever. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> oh, poor Eric. Bye. 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 Bye.